If you're feeling overwhelmed by the amount of data coming at us in the world of cancer, you're not alone. We've seen close to 10 new approvals and indications just within the last month and more than 40 new approvals in the year of 2025. And as a community general medical oncologist, we need to keep up with all this. We're hoping that these ongoing bite-sized discussions will keep us updated so we provide the best care close to home for all our patients. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Rahul Gosain here with my brother and co-host Rohit Gosain on our podcast, The Oncology Brothers. Hello, everyone. Rahul, you're right. FDA has been busy, that's for sure, which is exciting for our patients, their families, and of course, us as physicians. Today's topic at hand is Matterhorn study, responsible for bringing durvalumab in earlier lines for resectable GEJ and gastric adenocarcinoma. To walk us through this data, we have Dr. Yelena Jenjegian, a medical oncologist from Memorial Sloan Kettering and the lead author of Matterhorn study. Yelena, thanks so much for joining us and congratulations for this remarkable effort. And before you start, I need to ask you this question. Whose idea was that to come up with this clever name of D-flaw, Dr. Sam Klempner or yours? It was all Sam. Uh, in fact, <laughs> people don't use D-flat. I use the Dervolumab plus flat. I'm kind of a purist. The D is a little too informal. And I think the complete name is uh, warranted for this study. But yes, you were there at ASCO. <laughs> Indeed. And it was a crowd pleaser, as Sam often is. <laughs> Absolutely. Yelena, welcome. But before we get into Matterhorn study, to set the stage for our resectable esophageal G-junction or gastric cancer, options were concurrent chemo radiation based off cross-trial or periop and post-op flot based on chemotherapy. But then ESOPEC study at ASCO 2024 helped answer that majority of these patients have better outcomes with periop and post-op flot. This year at ASCO 2025, your study, Matterhorn, was asking the question, if we can do better by adding durvalumab to our standard of care chemotherapy. Delina, can you start us here with the study design and the findings for Matterhorn study? Absolutely. Matterhorn is the first global study to address this question. In gastric and esophageal adenocarcinoma, the studies typically separate between east and west, and the esophageal or G-junction tumors often include squamous cell cancer, which is, of course, a very outdated way to do the study. And as you mentioned, 90% of our patients succumb to the systemic disease recurrence. So to do an optimal systemic regimen was very important to me and our investigators as we were designing this question, this study. So it was patients with previously untreated, localized, non-metastatic gastroesophageal junction and gastric adenocarcinoma, irrespective of pdl one status. And this is a global study enrolling patient in Asia, Europe, North America, and South America. Patients were stratified by PDL1 tumor area positivity, which is another test to do, which is similar and comparable to CPS, which is the what you're probably used to hearing in metastatic disease. And of course, by clinical lymph node status and geographic region Asia versus non-Asia. This was one-to-one -one randomization and 948 patients were enrolled. This is a large study. For the first time, we were able to convince people from all over the world, including Asia, to give patients FLOT. The patients received standard FLOT before surgery. Um, here, the cycle is defined based on dervolumab dosing. I get a lot of direct messages on Twitter and emails from all over the world, I'm confused because it says two cycles, but two cycles include four doses of FLOT. It's yes. FLOT every two weeks, given for four doses with Derva given once every four weeks, that's why it's two doses of Dervolumab. We were able to demonstrate that this regimen is doable. More than three quarters of patients, close to all patients were able to complete these cycles. There was no compromise to likelihood of doing a complete surgery with addition of Dervolumab, which was again, very reassuring to see. Doing the immunotherapy while the tumor is still in place is so important because it can potentiate the anti-tumor immune response that the body is trying to mount themselves and also to continue recovery and micrometastasis suppression while the patient is recovering from the operation. Typically, the patients then received additional chemoimmunotherapy and here are the survival curves that, you know, put the smile on my face every time still <laughs> that I see. It never gets old and we're preparing now subsequent publication for the overall survival. Of course, you know, we demonstrated pathologic complete response improvement. We demonstrated that translate to event-free survival improvement. 
with a two-year landmark survival of 67% in a global study. But seeing overall survival data is so important, and that's what will really convince people that this is the regimen to give, with two-year overall survival of 76%. That's kind of all there is to it, right? It's feasible, and it improves all endpoints of clinical and survival data. Congratulations on this effort, Yelena. It just does not put a smile on your face, all our faces when we were sitting through ASCO and now catching up with ESMO. Yelena, with regards to what we saw at ESMO was EFS and oral survival. Two common questions that continue to come up is, can we extrapolate this data from GEJ and gastric adenocarcinoma to esophageal adenocarcinoma? And also, what we saw at ESMO 2025 was PDL1 aspect. Can this be tailored to PDL1 negative? That's a very good question. In terms of esophageal cancer, it depends on the location of the tumor. Most G junction tumors involve distal esophagus and then it extends into G junction. In fact, I've never right. seen a pure esophageal adenocarcinoma. Yes. Of course, if there's adenosquamous histology and if it's a mid-thoracic tumor where an R0 resection is not feasible, this regimen wouldn't apply. Multidisciplinary discussion is so critical. We enrolled esophageal you know, G-junction cancers at our site. We were that top enroller in the United States, and we had 100% R0 resection rate. Because we discussed these cases together, we carefully reviewed all the images. Patients with more advanced disease had laparoscopies. In terms of PDL1 status, I think the data is clear that most of our tumors are PDL1 positive. Even if you have any expression, there is a clear benefit. And the hazard ratio is still below one for PDL1 zero patients. The confidence interval is wide. So it yes. depends on how you see it. The NCCN approved this regimen right now based on PDL1 overexpression for CPS1 or greater. This was before OS data was available. There's talk with the EMA of approving it irrespective of PDL1. I can tell you it's unlikely that I, for example, in my practice, I don't restrict by PDL1. It would be a shame not to be able to offer these patients the treatment because it is improved, survival appears to be improved irrespective of PDL1. And as you said, the good thing is that majority of our patients are PDL1 positive. Well, since the inception of uh, this presentation at ASCO 2025, this treatment has been the new standard of care. Before we touch side effect profile and clinical pearls around that, the question is, are we over-treating some of our patients? This question comes about in breast cancer, lung cancer, and throughout solid tumors, especially when we have CTDNA at hand. Any role of that here based on Matterhorn, do you utilize that where you are deciding should you complete Durvalumab for one year time or halt it rather sooner? Yeah, so that's a great question. There's a lot of biomarker work that's currently ongoing, including multiplex assessment, blood mononucleoside assessments, looking at TCR expansion and so forth, but also, of course, CTDNA. Would I change practice based on CTDNA? No. I think we don't have prospective data. You probably saw it, ESMO, in the presidential session. What we know is that CTDNA is a prognostic tool. Whether or not it's going to be predictive in colon cancer, right. it hasn't panned out. In our disease, what I see in my clinic is approximately 20% of patients that are even CTDNA get negative will recur. And I think going by patients ability to tolerate adjuvant therapy or de-escalation based on what the patient is doing is really the gold standard how I approach this. I love to be fancy in my research, but in clinical practice, I stick to the data and I look at the patient. That's going to be a guiding star for this. Yelena, this is actually a good segue because one big reason to worry about overtreatment is side effects. Here we saw that one got what we were expecting when you're combining chemotherapy and durvalumab. And thankfully, we did not see a whole lot of discontinuation with Derva flat arm when compared to flat alone. Yelena, can you touch on the side effects we should keep on our radar and any clinical pearls around managing these when using Derva flat? Well, from the beginning, I can tell you in most of my patients who are your typical gastroesophageal cancer patient, maybe they're in their 60s or 70s who come in already a little malnourished, I don't use full doses flat. It's okay. You're allowed to dose reduced from the beginning. These are not protocol patients. Right. That's why I think even when we developed the Checkmate 649 regimen, right, more and more people are able to use full fox, for example, because they don't start with full doses full fox. Nobody does in practice, really. And the same thing for FLOT. I often 
admit leucovorin. And if there's a question about adverse events and concern for nutritional dose reduce oxala and docetaxel, I think I would rather do that than drop the third combination. There is something important about three drug combination in our disease because of its effect on the tumor and the microenvironment and augmenting the immune response that a devolumab then potentiates. I think seeing your patient sometimes in week one post-treatment, if you're not comfortable with this regimen or having your nurse practitioner see the patient, will give you a flavor of how they're tolerating the therapy. The good news is however they tolerated cycle one is how they will be tolerating subsequent cycles. So what practically I do is give them all the antiemetics to take home with, including, you know, Reglan, Zofran, things like that. Sometimes some patients need olanzapine. But really, you know, most patients get away with just the minimal side effects. If you monitor them carefully, sometimes people need hydration at the disconnect and it just gets them through the bump. As you said, Darolimab does not add much of the tox. Most of the tox comes from the chemotherapy. You'll see data I'm presenting at ESMO Asia in Singapore next week that doctors in Japan, Taiwan, and South Korea are able to give FLOT. You know, the, yep. you, the part of the world that never used to give FLOT. Yep. I, and what we also saw, you know, the dogma was like, oh, only Germans know how to give FLOT. That's not true. <laughs> North Americans did very well with dose intensity and delivery. I think the whole idea of giving patients an opportunity to get immunotherapy in early phase of their disease is a game changer because we will be able to cure more patients. You know, can I piggyback quickly on this as well, uh, Yelena? It was not just the West or the East, even here in the U.S. in community settings, we're struggling to get flat. And that's the reason why a lot of us in community settings, including myself, were leaning into this cross study. But then again, post SOPAC and the idea that we're worried about micromats, flat is now the standard of care. And I do think that we're getting better and better in managing this particular chemo regimen in outpatient settings. I have not radiated a patient in probably close to six, seven years. I mean, right. you're doing your patients a disservice. Absolutely. To yep. And with regards to when you mentioned that you dose reduce oxaliplatin and docetaxel, what dose reduction are we talking about? 10%, 15%, and then you up titrate if you see they're able to tolerate? No, I typically don't titrate up because, again, we're going for overall dose density, right? right. Ideally, we know that even in an adjuvant setting, if you can deliver more treatment, that's better. Okay. To avoid grade two neuropathy, and, and no, I don't titrate. If I, I make a decision based on, you know, percent of body weight that the patient lost, what are their abilities to eat? What is their base? And But I've given flawed even in patients with pre-existing diabetic neuropathy and gotten away with it. And the patients just want to survive this, right? Uh, right. Even if they right. lose their hair, all of that is reversible. Neuropathy right. is the main irreversible thing right. that you worry about. I don't usually use you know, delayed steroids because remember, we want to preserve those gentle T cells, yeah. right? And we don't yeah. want to clog them. So if, you know, I usually try to avoid steroids if needed, the oral steroids. And some patients, very few, the younger women get a lot of nausea and so forth. So the dose reduction, you know, standard dose reduction, maybe go down to 70 milligrams per meter squared of right. oxali and dose of 40 or 35, depending on how, so about 15, 20%. Right. And usually... Most patients require dose reduction, but if you hit them over the head with a full dose right. float and they're running for the hills, you don't right. give anyone any service. Now, managing side effect profile and starting right dose is the key. And again, majority of patients would go for DFLOT. The question is, who would not? Uh, Yelena, uh, with regards to someone that you would not consider this regimen, certainly someone who is contraindicated for immunotherapy or one who's not a surgical candidate, who else would you rather refrain from this therapy? So sometimes we see these octogenarians. There's a bimodal distribution of increase right. of GI cancers. We see the people like you and I, Right. healthy individuals with no risk factors, and those usually get G-junction tumors. Right. But also we have octogenaries who have been living normal lives, and then because they were on five and aspirin start bleeding or um, something like that. And if they have distal gastric cancer, and you can get away with subtotal gastrectomy, let's not be too crazy. What are we actually <laughs> trying to improve right. here? I would yep. just take them to the OR. <laughs> and then these in the middle of people who are, you know, just borderline, maybe they're not all that resectable. Uh, maybe, you know, eventually we could get a, a surgery done and they're, you know, not perfect candidates. I think it's justifiable to use full Fox Nevo in those patients. Sometimes we convert them to resection, sometimes not. Because for those people, 
you know, I think full Fox Nevo you would be able to do for six months and then not rush to surgery, do surgery right. after for six months. Elena, you've been part of many of these studies here in this space that continue to change the standard of care for this disease. And because of this, our patients are indeed living longer. Coming back to Matterhorn, thankfully, you brought this up as well. We're not compromising any surgical outcomes here. So this is now what we should be using in majority of our patients that meet this inclusion criteria. Delina, before we close, any final thoughts for our listeners treating this disease? It's an amazing time to be in this field. And like you said, even the surgeons are embracing this approach. I've been speaking at a lot of surgical meetings. It's devastating to have your patient recur. It's the worst day when something happens and I come home. Right. To be able to get them through an operation successfully and to use these modern options, everyone's on board. I'm excited for this and we can continue to build on it. We have now HER2 positive perioperative strategies, quad and positive right. and so forth. Um, so stay tuned for more. Exciting times indeed, Yelena, and again, congratulations for advancing this field. And thank you so much for touching on Matterhorn study and practical discussion around this, where we now stand and we have Duralumab available with chemotherapy as a new standard of care. For our listeners, let us go over a quick recap from today's discussion. To summarize for the ones tuning in, today we've discussed the Matterhorn phase three trial evaluating Duralumab added to periopflot for resectable gastric and GE junction adenocarcinoma. At two-year mark, the overall survival is close to 76% with dervalumab and close to 70.4% in control arm. This is now the new standard of care treatment for this patient population. Raul, in my practice, I'm also extrapolating this data to esophageal adenocarcinoma, and that's exactly what Dr. Jinjikian pointed out as well. Whereas for pdl one negative, I have a low threshold to drop Dervalumab if I run into side effects. And yes, we did touch on side effects and clinical pearls around this. Rohit, another thing to keep in mind is, thankfully, we did not see a significant drop-off or discontinuation when Dervalumab was added to this treatment paradigm. Also, we're not compromising any surgical outcomes here. Thanks for listening. If you found this helpful, share the episode with colleagues and leave us a review so we can continue to reach out to more oncologists out there. We'll be back soon with more practice-changing updates in oncology. We are the Oncology Brothers.